that's it. That's all we take. That's it for this week. I now have to go and hide in an edit for 23 hours. Um, could you give? They don't uh, need to know that. <laughs> they do. It's important. They don't. My name is Jeremy Hardy. I am a comedian, or writer and broadcaster if I'm trying to sound grown up. I've always been vaguely active in politics, but in March 2002, when a Palestinian producer called Layla invited me to help her defeat the Israeli army, the meaning of involvement moved to another level. I could see she had a strange faith in the power of minor celebrity, a conviction I did not really share, but I was reluctant to disappoint her. Travelling thousands of miles to face the world's fourth biggest military power wasn't my idea of a holiday. On the other hand, the alternative was spending Easter in Florida with my in-laws. Palestine won. I arrive in Tel Aviv on Good Friday, just as the Israelis invade Ramallah, the largest town in the West Bank. They offered not to put a stamp in my passport. I asked them not to put one in. I promised my daughter to keep safe. I hope I can keep the promise. It's midnight when I reach the Star Hotel in Bethlehem the base of a campaign drawing people from around the world. No, OK, I'll maybe get one later. On the journey here, I've got to know some of the Britons. This is Chris, director of an energy firm in London, here on his third visit. Kunli, a Glaswegian technology consultant. Young Emma, from Bristol University, and finally Nicholas, a Manchester novelist married to Layla, the woman responsible for my predicament. And of course, me. Well, at least my room's okay. And here is the little town of Bethlehem. How still we see thee lie. I wonder for how much longer. who are going to go to uh, Ramallah, and I, I, intend to be, I intend to be one of those. That's today, yeah. yeah. It's closed, you know, nobody is allowed to get in, either media, reporter, international, Palestinian, nobody's allowed to get in. We wake up to the news that Ramallah is completely sealed off. While I get to know Hassan Andoni, one of the masterminds behind this rather unusual initiative, Layla stresses over our cameraman, who's stuck in Ramallah with no hope of getting out. He's apparently been filming with Oliver Stone. Oliver has now left, but failed to smuggle our man out. So for now, we have to enlist the local wedding photographer. We're going to take the training group down and we're going to get started on training. Please keep in mind, as you all know and had read in the packet ahead of time, it's ISN's policy that everyone who participates in these campaigns goes through the nonviolence training. And if you do not participate in the training, you are at risk of being sent home or asked not to participate. The aim of this campaign was to help Palestinian farmers tend their fields against the aggression of armed settlers. But there's a lot of confusion as to what will happen in the next few days. I'm not sure if we are in denial but our training carries on as planned. And, and that, is, that is not the place for us. The International Solidarity Movement, as it is called, is based on principles of non-violence. No the idea, as I'm told, is not to pray for peace, but to help the Palestinians dismantle the Israeli system of control. I think people have to think about it carefully and, and be sure that they are willing to do that. Hassan argues that if the Intifada becomes the property of a few idealists, brandishing yesteryear's guns against a high-tech army, Palestinians will be fighting a lost cause. But in order to mobilize all members of society, Palestinians need protection. 
This is where the internationals come in. If a foreign presence can help Palestinians defy the orders of the Israeli army collectively and regularly, the occupation will become the Israelis' burden. I thank you very much for your solidarity visit. We hope that you will visit us next time when we have our freedom and our state. And thank you. Having become experts on how to cool situations down when facing police, soldiers and irate settlers, the group moves to the next stage of the training. We learn to work in small units capable of taking quick decisions and functioning autonomously in critical situations. First, each member of the group has to choose a role that suits them best. I've been told not to be a clown already. That was a, that was a quick regime. That's all I can do. <laughs> <laughs> While the group moves to practice role play, Layla and I climb out onto the balcony of the Star Hotel to have a look at her hometown. Here at the highest point in Bethlehem, you can see the Nativity Church looming in the distance. Most of our people have already gathered in Manger Square, and we're joining them in a minute to show solidarity and meet the locals. Looking beyond the ancient town, we see the breeze blocks of the Jewish settlements newly built on lands confiscated from Palestinians. This is how Leila's family lost theirs, just after the Oslo Agreement. How would she believe that Israelis want peace? This is where the internationals and the Palestinians express fraternal greetings. I spare half an ear for the speeches, but I can't ignore the creeping sense of disquiet. There are fighters here putting on a show of strength. I seek strength in falafel. We've survived the night. Maybe because it's Easter Sunday, the Israelis decided an attack on Bethlehem wouldn't look too good. There are no actions today. Everyone is taking the opportunity to look around and learn about the situation. You know, Bethlehem, it's a hilly uh, country, a hilly city. It's built on seven hills. Right. I get shown around by the mayor of Bethlehem, Hannah Nasser. And the Vatican and Moscow, they are built on seven hills. Yes, yeah. we have this uh, similarity, at least in, uh, in topography. <laughs> yeah, see, this is a, an arch, this is one of the entrances. Right. Uh, most of the, of the leaders uh, of the world came here. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Most of them. Thank you, then. We start at the Church of the Nativity, which is divided into sections to accommodate various Christian denominations. I get to see the cave where Christ is said to have been born, and it's all very interesting. Except that the habitual tourist experience is over very quickly. I've just been made aware that this very church is likely to be used as a refuge by local fighters if the Israelis choose to invade again. So now we move on to the grim reality of the place. 
Here is a house whose owners, an elderly couple, were lucky to survive. Now you see the... Oh, that's where the shell hit. Yes. <laughs> they left only one day before it was blown up by a missile fired from an army base nearby. We have um, a few dozens of houses has been uh, hit, similar to that one. Here are the remains of the last relics of the British Empire, an administrative building from the Mandate, which recently housed the Palestinian National Authority in Bethlehem. And destroyed all the infrastructure, electricity, water, telephones. You know, the city was uh, about uh, two weeks, but not a single drop of water. They have destroyed the main pipes. Intentionally, intentionally. When did they last do that? This was uh, before three weeks, the last invasion. Three weeks ago? Yes. At noon, we arrive at the Dahesha camp set up for refugees driven out of their homes in northern Palestine in 1948. Now 12,000 people live in one and a half square kilometers, surviving on handouts from the UN and other donors. A lot of the activists, particularly Italians and Belgians, have already moved into the camp, hoping to lessen the brutality of the army in case of an invasion. Are you from Yabasta? No, we are not from Yabasa, we are from other uh, activist groups in Italy. Yeah. When the Israelis went in three weeks ago, the camp was heavily shelled. Every man from the age of 16 to 50 was arrested and interrogated. So how many internationals have you got in the camp now? hundred? As residents, nearly 50. Yes, yes, nearly 50. Do you feel safer when there are internationals staying in the camps, you know, people from come in solidarity, or does it make no difference? We are worried about their safe. Right. <laughs> really, we are is it more, is worried it? about their safety because Sharon's government killed journalists, killed yeah. foreign people. There's no one has, yeah, no one is secure. has no. a prestige yeah. out of his death. The ISM says you'll go to the camps as a, partly as an act of solidarity and partly as a human shield, you know, uh, to protect the people in the camp. But you don't think it'll make any difference to the Israelis that they're in? So, it won't make any difference for Israeli soldiers, even international people or Palestinian people, the city or the camp. There's no any difference. The spookiness of the place and the prospect of another invasion is beginning to creep up on me. Just as the mayor drops me at the local maternity hospital, my final tourist destination for today. I'm beginning to think that my decision to come here was very unwise. We, in the past few months, we've been attacked on twice by the Israeli forces as they were occupying Bethlehem. And the last time is on the 14th of uh, uh, March, in fact. A tank stopped by the intersection, pointed its guns at the hospital and started shooting in our direction. They hit the building on several levels and they hit the church which is in the middle of the hospital and they hit the statue of the Virgin Mary. And they hit it first with bullets, completely destroying it in fact. And after that, they sent a wire guided missile onto the church walls. By the time I get to Layla's relative's house for Easter lunch, I can barely talk. Hello, you two. Nicholas is here, and he's invited another English author, Lillian, from the group. Um, you seem really depressed. I'm um, really. see the hospital where they machined gunned <laughs> the Israelis machine gunned it from a tank, a dirty hospital. And uh, it looks like it's going to be pretty bad tonight. Layla's relatives aren't in good spirits either. Out of the 40 guests invited, only a few could make it. Tanks have been spotted on the outskirts of the town. The invasion is now certain. 
Just as the coffee is served, we learn that a curfew has been announced. Well, welcome to Palestine. This is how it is. You should all just come and live in England. Welcome to Palestine. This is You've got to do something about the weather first. <laughs> Someone has spotted an army jeep, which means that our journey back to the hotel might be problematic. He's just yeah. pulling alongside. Oh, they're letting him go. He's gone by. Are they letting, they're letting him go? Pu he just pulled past it. Oh, no. Are they still there? Oh, they're getting him out. Let's see. No, he's, he's moving. I get jumpy when people rush to the window. We can certainly walk and negotiate. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, some activists managed to get in with Arafat just now. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, that's great. I think this, is, this thing, whole thing is blown up out of all proportion. <laughs> I knew I should have done the other thing. Thanks for having you here. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Let's hope you'll come in happier times. Yes, I will. I would like that. <laughs> So we're walking from zone C into zone B, yeah? Okay. Sorry, I feel guilty. I brought you here. Yeah, well. <laughs> I'm not sure what to do with you now. <clears throat> no. I, uh, part of the problem is the, um, the uh, solidarity movement people. I think that most of them are crazy. And I think that they're living out some vainglorious sort of fantasy about their own lives. <laughs> I'll be all right. Some things you gotta do. I don't think under the current circumstances we can really go ahead and do other activities as planned from before. I, I think it's important for the group to be responding to the need right now and it's, it's really changing. We, we just cannot ignore this. This is my feeling. If Israel decides to go ahead and either kill or deport the Palestinian current leadership, then we will be facing an open, really open conflict here that none of us would be able to predict where it will lead us. I mean, it will be a state of chaos in a sense. Uh, there is another uh, huge commercial compound in Ramallah that's being shelled and bombarded by the Israeli army and there are lots of people inside it. Reports are coming that so many people are injured there and they are not giving any access to ambulances. <coughs> I don't know if this is the place in this meeting. I wanted to know if we could talk about the process of being human shields and the organization of that. We didn't really process what that meant as a group. We're not here to be human shields, and what are we here for? Some I think we do. I think we respect we some kind of process here. Okay, okay. War crimes have been happening in Ramallah in the last 24, 48 hours. It is going to come here. There is no doubt of that. And I think both I and Rob are just very concerned that people realize that, that they understand it, that they comprehend the difference that we've experienced here in the last few days. I give more credit to the people here uh, that they do understand what, uh, uh, what they came for. And none of us can be pre prepared for uh, every contingency, but in that case we're, we're, we're no different from the, the people we're uh, trying to protect. The first time it occurred to me like what might happen was when we were sat here just before leaving to the camp when he said like about F-16s coming in, about indiscriminate um, shootings and things and like we might be in the middle of all this. That was the first time it came to me and for a good like three hours I was sat down like quite scared and sort of like taking this in and trying to think about what it meant for me. The impression I got was the human shield isn't something the Israelis are going to respect. I mean, yesterday I visited the maternity hospital where the tank had machine gunned the front of the hospital and tried to destroy the statue of the Virgin Mary above the hospital. I, um, clearly, if uh, women giving birth don't operate as a human shield, um, I'm not convinced that a bunch of people from around the world who don't have the support of our own embassies are gonna, I, I, and the impression I got was that the more we do together as a large group, the more effective it is. 
Sani morti di fame, ma quelli che girano sono di Well, one thing you can say for sure about these people is they're determined. After airing misgivings and fears about our new role as human shields, everyone still decided to stay. A large number will be moving to the refugee camps tonight. But first, a curfew breaking march to show the army that internationals are present in the area. Having argued it was safer to do things in large groups, I could hardly opt out. God knows why I'm smiling. Oh yeah. <laughs> This is Mortaza with the Italians. Eric and Paul. The French. And this is me, Jeremy Hardy. A few minutes ago I was terrified. Now I'm just stunned and angry. Okay, so What? you have a meeting. I think so. Is it? I don't know. Who, who is the responsible? Around in front of people. I thought that it was. I was talking about rubber bullets, not the rubber. I thought they were rubber bullets. They're not rubber bullets. They're live rounds. Really? They fired them into the ground in front ah. of people and they ricocheted into the people. Ah. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine, thanks. No problem. I was standing by the side of the road, having moved back twice. And I'd just taken the photograph of the um, tank driver and was putting my camera away um, when I got a sudden pain in my face. A very loud bang. Pain here and pain here. It's, it's not, uh, not really very serious, actually. Are you, you feel shaken up? Or? Yeah, a bit. Yeah. 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 Has anything, nothing like that happened to you before? No. <laughs> <laughs> Is it Chris Dunham? Yeah, yeah, Dunham, yeah. Yeah, Chris Dunham, a shrapnel in the hand. Sorry, Chris, how old are you? 31. He's 31, but he doesn't look it. Bring you back. It started out like this. International protesters, Britons among them, on the streets of Bethlehem. Israeli tanks nearby, war closing in, but no hint of danger yet, and no fear among the protesters. Obviously there is a risk and I don't particularly want to get hurt but I think um, that life is about risks and these people, they need us here. But this was the greeting from Israeli troops, what appeared to be live rounds fired towards unarmed demonstrators. Uh, it's just my parents that know I'm here. Oh! It take years off their life if they knew I was here, so best not to tell them. I understand. How old are they? <laughs> How many years is, is it going to take off their life when they read the front page to see three Britain, four Britons, you know, injured in Israeli attack on civilians? Well, hopefully they won't notice. I need to ring this telegraph guy. 
No, yeah. seriously. Yeah. seriously. Yeah. Sure. Where were you hurt? You obviously in your chin. Was that um, was that just the one bit you got? No, no, he's in no the chin, chin, chest, oh, and six, elbow. Yeah. Right. That was the uh, mirror. And you they want to speak to all of us well, that were. Ah, was that? Wow. It comes to mirror. Okay. Um, does anyone want to speak to mirror? I'll pass you over to Chris. Um, I was carrying a, a banner and um, uh, I was hit in the in the hand by a piece of shrapnel. Um, so there's a bit of bullet still in my hand. And they showed the interview of me and then they showed the, the footage of the cameras being shot at. Headline news. I, well, it was before we got it was before we got shot at. So I was just talking about why we were here and, and what we were hoping to do. And you know, yesterday and this morning, I was in a right fucking state. I was just thinking, this is just insane. What the fuck am I doing here? This is madness and foolhardy and vainglorious, and we're all going to die. <laughs> which, is, which is still true. But I, but I say that with respect now. <laughs> Well, does it change your tactics? Yeah. That's what all the press keeps saying. Oh. And what would you say to I said, no, not at all. <laughs> We're absolutely we determined. Love it. Steadfast. There's no turning back. The Israelis seized Bethlehem. That night was one of fear and confusion. We could hear gunfire, tanks, helicopters and F-16 jets. About 250 Palestinians, most of them fighters but also civilians, took refuge in the Church of the Nativity. We feared for their lives and for our friends who stayed in the camps. It was impossible to tell what was happening outside. The sound was enough to keep us away from the windows, but by morning some of us dared to take an occasional peep. Hmm. There are tanks down on the road there, you can see. That's Manger Square, there are injured and dying there. No one can get to. Most of the violence happened down in that area, although there were snipers around here and French crew got fired on when they tried to go out. And the hotel manager went out to try and get the um, generator working and was shot at. But most of the fighting happened down in there. The invasion is complete now. This is military occupation. Israeli snipers are taking up positions around the hotel. Tanks surround us from every direction. And behind them, Caterpillar D9 bulldozers, the signature weapon of the Israeli army, in case you thought Caterpillar just made comfy boots. Inside, people react in different ways some taking names and passport numbers, some trying to give articulate interviews to the media. The British consulate was sending a car to pick some of us up, but it couldn't get through. There was a definite possibility that those who didn't leave would be stranded here indefinitely. For me, it all felt like a Vietnam movie with all the media and the flak jackets and all the talk of evacuation. But for the locals, it was the third Israeli incursion in less than a year. Uh, we've had to, we're, we're doing shifts in the kitchen now to um, take some of the pressure off the staff, put those uh, uh, bloodshed down in the town. There's a lot of uh, people lying injured in Manger Square. There are people in homes uh, injured. There are children in a house where their mother's been killed. We were asked to go out last night, bring the children back to the hotel. We thought it wasn't safe either for us 
for them. The children in particular are distressed, they're in no danger. It's just the fact that they're sitting there with their mother's body. The news crew couldn't get down that way anyway, and none of the press here, there's loads of press, international press, they couldn't get down. So the chances of us getting down are also fair. I don't, I don't even, even let us go. I've made a personal decision that, because I promised my daughter that I'd take the best of care and not put myself in the firing line. She has to be my first responsibility and I have to not get killed. We're still here hoping the constable will get us out, but we're all right, we're okay. The bar's pretty empty now, so I guess we'll all be going teetotal pretty soon. We're not the story, the, the plucky Brits in the hotel are not the story, the story is down in the square where the, where the people are injured and dying. All of the people in the camps have decided to stay. I have complete admiration for them. A couple of days ago I would have said they're bonkers and they're putting themselves in danger to no great purpose. Now I think they possibly have saved lives and uh, I have absolute complete respect for all of them. Many of these people are a lot, a lot braver than me anyway. Uh, and, no, thank uh, you. I think we're pretty much done. Complete admiration for them, absolute. Please, please, the Americans are going, please stand here. So the main thing is you want to go to the American culture. Raise your hands over your head, we're not going to take you out. You got to go out? It's all you can see. Let's go, let's keep moving here. Next, next, next. Who's next, guys? Back. Who's next? I'm going to get on your next. back as much as you can take. Okay. The British people. You are going with the convoy. We Can have you please one here? Japanese to go. Okay, right. The British there people. Are there any other Americans who would like to leave? Right here, I'm I'll just take packing my bag. Besides Rippy, are there any other Americans? This is the last call for Americans. Oh, British. Follow that guy. British. Follow that guy. Follow you know, they are not chicken. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> bye bye. Same over here. This was pleasure. Right. See you, 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 see because it is a marvellous thing. We're all in this hotel and it's all under siege and everything. And the Americans and the Brits and the, and the Japanese and the Italians are all being evacuated that day. And it was, I just, I'm not a patriot, but the first time in, my, time in my life I thought, I actually do like being British. Because the American drivers turned up and they were CIA and they had flak jackets, they had helmets, they had guns. Our guy had driving gloves. <laughs> I've been quite restless since I got back from Palestine. Hello? Yeah. I spend a lot of time on the phone to people I met there. Because it's a march, it's on Sunday, isn't it? <clears throat> okay, anyway, how are you doing? Well, back, uh, and not entirely unscathed, uh, our comedian Jeremy Hardy and a businessman Chris Dunham, who it's fair to say probably got rather more than they bargained for, especially you, Chris, because you were hit by shrapnel. Well, it's, uh, it's completely mad. I mean, I've been there before. They've used uh, rubber bullets, um, sound grenades, uh, tear gas canisters, but nobody's ever fired uh, real live right. ammunition at me. Now, one girl is still in hospital, an Australian girl, she took a live round right in the stomach, you know. So they, and this, the firing carried on for several minutes. It wasn't like a sudden panic. And even yeah. when you see us backing away, hands up, it kept going on. I want to know why you go. I mean, you know, we've all been... A lot of us have been giving interviews and doing media work. Not that it's easy to communicate the frustration or the horror on the ground. What good do you think you can do? Well, there are people in the camps now who've stayed, and, and I have absolute admiration. There are people, internationals, including a neighbour of mine from Streatham, 64 years old, in the camps trying to prevent atrocities by, th by saying, look, we're internationals, and if our embassies are phoning up saying to the Israeli army, don't kill our people, maybe the Israeli army will hold off and not start firing shells into the refugee camps. So I think lives are being saved as we speak. And you'd still go back? Yeah, I mean, I'd go back at a quieter time. Would you go back? Absolutely, we're pr planning to go back in June. Even if you risk your life doing so? Well, we're prepared for that. I mean, a lot of us feel very passionately about the Palestinian 
cause and the plight of the Palestinians, and it seems to be an injustice which has been going on for so long. Images of the destruction of Bethlehem as Israeli tanks rolled into the old city were all over the news. But the news has a different impact when you become involved in the story. Layla's grand plan to have me rescue her country doesn't seem to have come off. She had stayed behind to witness her hometown being trashed. This is the family with the children we failed to help. Only a few days ago I was staying in a hotel just around the corner. This is another child born at the maternity hospital I visited to a mother who had to make her way here on foot carrying a white flag. Dr. Tabashi's own clinic in the centre of town was vandalised, like a lot of buildings and institutions essential to the running of the country. Most houses in Bethlehem were raided. I learned that the mayor was thrown out twice in the middle of the night while his house was searched. The army took over the Star Hotel, while gruesome news of events in Janine, Nablus and other towns kept coming in. I continued to receive round-the-clock updates from the makeshift press office and despite the curfews, the shellings, the Israeli snipers and the tank patrols, the ISM remains in business. Leila and Nicholas are still there and on April the 7th I'm concerned to hear that the group are to undertake an attempt to break the siege, trying to carry medical supplies and food into the Church of the Nativity. Go in, but we want five people to go in, or whatever people feel safe with. Perhaps we should try to focus that it's the ambulance we want to get in. So first of all, I need to know who has medical experience. Medical experience. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I have a nurse coming. Very good. Okay. And everyone knows who to look for for direction. Okay, hands up the people who will be going in. Into the square or into the church? Into the church. Yeah, basically, people in front of us are on the sides of the ambulance. Who's been elected to speak to the guy? Steve. Steve speaks to me. Steve. Okay. They were devastated to fail. I was relieved they came out alive. A later attempt falters on the narrow steps of Bethlehem's market. Bread in our bags, 95 bags of bread. Take one down, pass it around. 
I'm beginning to recognize some of the names and faces behind the campaign. Two of the most determined activists are star-crossed lovers from New York, her family Palestinian, his Jewish, and together they help to start the movement. Soldiers, there are people inside the church that also need food. This is breaking international law, what you're doing. This is an immoral order. You don't have to listen to your commander. It's in Israeli law. You're protected by the Supreme Court if you do that. Huayda and Adam have already become experts on breaking through Israeli lines. See where the Israeli forces are. And at that point, we'll decide at what, at what... During the siege of Ramallah, Adam succeeded in leading a party into Yasser Arafat's compound. Not once, but twice, taking the Israelis completely by surprise. Help each other up, guys. Help each other. Make sure everyone's up. They did it very courageously. Very, very courageous. Yes, yes. So they were shooting from here and from here and from here, <laughs> all, all around them. I feel a strong bond with the people who shared my experiences in Bethlehem. To lose touch with them now would be unthinkable. My interview partner, Chris, lives quite near to me in South London, and after sharing the Richard and Judy television sofa together, we begin to see each other quite often. He's becoming my environmental conscience. You'd think he's a full-time activist, but he's also director of a sustainable energy firm employing 15 people with responsibilities I'm sure would do my head in. Shortly after we got back, he sent round an email trying to persuade all of us to buy a wind-up phone charger. This is one of the alternative ways of recharging your batteries. Just five minutes of winding time will give you ten minutes of talking. I wonder what fools will fall for it. The siege in Bethlehem is in its 30th day. Help and supplies continue to be denied to the wounded inside the church. Earlier, one room was set on fire by an Israeli flare or bullet. The man who tried to douse the flames was shot. After long negotiations, several dead bodies are brought out and some teenagers are allowed to leave. Today, though, the ordinary routine was broken. I woke up to the news that the ISM had managed to pull off an unexpected coup. As ten internationals pushed their way into the church. Among them, some of the people from my group. Mary, an Irish nurse, is the last one in. By the summer, the Israelis have really caught on to what's happening, and hundreds of people heading to the West Bank were turned back at the borders. An estimated 2,000 visitors were denied entry in 2002. They were also getting tougher on the ground. Still, the international solidarity movement was planning a massive campaign to stretch throughout the whole summer, Freedom Summer. And my mad friends are contemplating joining in. So being shot didn't put you off going back then, either of you? No. No. <laughs> it's a highlight, really, wasn't it? It's, it's quite an honour to just spill a small drop of blood. Yeah, I suppose. What's the likelihood of you coming back from this trip alive now? I'm quite worried about it, actually. Yeah, I, haven't felt, right. I, haven't, I haven't felt I'm worried, worried before so yeah, I was worried at all. Time. Apart from yeah. maybe the first time I went, I, when I didn't know. But after that, I felt a kind of maybe false sense of security. But this time, I feel a bit as though... Mm. It's very, very dangerous, really. Yeah. You just say I want to go and found an illegal settlement in the West Bank. <laughs> <laughs> Is anyone suggesting that you shouldn't go, like friends or family? Or... Yeah, yeah. And my sister's got me a flak jacket. But the thing is, I can't really take it in with me. You know? yeah. it's like, no. Unless you said you were a flak jacket salesman. <laughs> <laughs> Chris and Nicholas have already decided they're heading back. Layla is certain to go. James, Cunley and Isa are joining in later, and I believe young Emma is packing her bags. A lot of did just the so now, the question for me is, what am I going to do? 
You know, I've toughened you up now. Because I've been pushed around by the Metropolitan Police, the Royal Oster Constabulary. <laughs> no, nah, they're not these, they're, they're children, these people. <laughs> Next time I see them, the, the riot police getting out of vans, I'll just be, oh, batten, charge me, big boy. <laughs> I don't get out of bed for anything less than an armoured personnel carrier now. <laughs> but in your non-violence training, you see, you have to not panic. You have to show dignity and discipline in retreat. So you put your arms in the air and you walk back very slowly. I will not show fear, I will retain calm and dignity, and I will just stand behind a big tall fucker. <laughs> because they're firing live rounds at us. I'm in. I've joined Emma and we're playing it bold. We're heading straight to Tel Aviv Airport hoping we can bluff our way in. I only have four days to spare, but I decided to spend them in Palestine. Chris and Nicholas are taking different routes across the bridge through Jordan. If things went according to plan, they might be in Jerusalem already. Oh, hey, Chris. Hey, Chris. <laughs> All right, how you doing? Oh, good to see you. Did you get grilling at the bridge? Oh, God, I got grilled for, for 20 minutes, which I thought, which to me seemed like ages. I thought they were never going to stop. But I've stopped that calling it a grilling now because I found out yesterday that somebody was interrogated for six hours. Jesus. And then they didn't get in. So my 20 minutes seems a bit... <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. The whole ISM operation has now moved to Jerusalem, as Bethlehem has been under 24-hour curfew since we left. They were stripped, beaten, arrested. Activists arrive here first, and are then dispersed to different regions depending on demand. This is the birthplace of three great religions, the most deserted top tourist destination on Earth. But never mind, we're all here. God, I should never have given these people independence, in my opinion. It's just bloody savages. I haven't seen a necktie since I got here. <laughs> now, from our very first campaign, we were called propaganda ploys of the Palestinian Authority. In December, we were called terrorist tourists. You know, they say some of our members are insane. Uh, they try to say some of our activists that come here are just, you know, radical troublemakers. They have nothing better to do at home, so there's another, you know, conflict or trouble spot that they found, and so they want to come make trouble, and they don't know about the conflict. It's set out tomorrow morning fairly early. We just need to arrange with the villagers what time. They need as much manpower as possible. Um, and obviously they're afraid because they still believe like settlers and soldiers are going to be out there harassing and shooting and whatever. Um, so they've asked for internationals to come down. There is a group. Training takes place twice a week now as new people arrive on a regular basis. There are at least a hundred in the country at any one time, which isn't bad considering the number of people who get turned back at the borders. So we're going to see if we can do something this year for it. These gatherings are important so that people get updates on what is happening around the country and find out about possible actions to join. I finally get the chance to meet some of the figures who became legendary in the last campaign. Today's training was led by Adam and Hueda, who are back in the country after their high security wedding in the States. Jewish Taliban weds was the headline in the New York Post the day after weds the day after our wedding. But at least you get free free wedding photographs. That's right. Yeah, I wish we did it before we hired our photographer. <laughs> he wasn't very good. So when you go back to the States now, I mean, do people think you're nuts? Or do you, what do your families think? Um, our families are definitely very concerned for us. I mean, from the minute I moved out here on the phone, my father would always say, stay out of trouble, stay out of conflict areas. 
uh, not knowing that the conflict finds you and is all around you. Yes, you can stay in your home uh, if you so choose, or you can be out there doing something to change the situation. So I'd be on my way to a demonstration and my father would be stay away from those demonstrations not knowing that I had helped plan this demonstration. <laughs> my family has received uh, death threats and things, you know, that sort of ugliness in the States, but uh, when I was back home I didn't, personally didn't face any of that and I met many, many supportive people. Um, yeah, I think probably people do think we're a little crazy, but, and, and we probably are a little crazy. <laughs> Basically, all this sums up to do not make any comments, do not say anything that will divide people even more than they already are. You just keep remembering, someday there's going to be a reconciliation. Don't put it further back than it already is. It's coming, I think, to a point where just about everything else has been tried except ending the occupation. And ultimately, I think people are going to wake up and realize that's what has to happen. Why not? People are traumatized. People are traumatized and we're trying to figure out where can we go and how can we build again and how can we overcome this overwhelming force. And the ISM, I think, gives hope to people in that we still do believe in the power of the people. And uh, whether or not they believe we can affect change on the ground uh, anytime soon, it remains to be seen. We truthfully have yet to see a victory from nonviolent resistance. Layla can't quite believe that I'm back. She's not persuaded by my claim that it's because I promised Richard and Judy. I explain about Bethlehem and my need to see it again. This isn't going to be an easy task because Bethlehem is completely sealed off now, but I want to try straight after I buy a hat to keep the sun off. How about this? A little dull? A little safe? Oh, look at this. No, that's ridiculous. Really? Oh. That's nice though, I like to No, I'm not wearing a fez. What do you reckon? I'm going to get one later for weddings and funerals. I don't know. I'm, I'm certainly I'm inspired by him. Well, he's sensible. He's brave, but he's never kind of like vain glorious. And he's, um, you know, he clarifies your thinking when you're kind of getting bogged down and confused about things. He kind of puts it all very clearly and he's very passionate about the situation here. Yeah. This is going to keep coming for years and years, and I suppose I'll probably feel. I'm more worried about them being shot. Actually, it's one of the good guys, and the good guys tend to get tend to get whacked in my experience. So I'm just hoping he keeps himself safe. We came across uh, this roadblock. We found people uh, stuck on either side. People waiting to go to hospital. Pregnant women. A boy who'd been injured by the, the army and they were trying to carry him across. We must have ferried about 40 people across. The army were trying to stop us, but we just ignored them and went, uh, and went straight past. I snuck into Bethlehem yesterday to find the streets completely empty and devastated. 30,000 inhabitants are locked inside their homes. It's a ghost town. Star Hotel is empty. Ahmed lives and sleeps here alone. He's had no visitor since we left. Only mad dogs and Englishmen venture outside. My passport is supposed to offer some kind of protection, but even then breaking the curfew is a bit nerve-wracking. Down. Yeah. I visited Hassan in his confinement. He's been a prisoner in his own house since April, just like everyone else. I mean, they managed to destroy the basis of our normal life as Palestinians. And that's scary. I mean, you cannot rebuild that easily. People don't work. Kids don't go to schools. There is no shops in the streets. Tanks roam the streets to enforce the curfew. So there's nothing he can do now. We have to depend on ourselves. 
I stayed the night in a refugee camp to see what it's like to be a human shield. Although I've come a bit late to help this family. When my house uh, is destroyed, many people, many... Come uh, to the Hesha. Hanadi, the eldest daughter, is expecting her first baby while her husband is in prison indefinitely. Her house has just been demolished. Her 22-year-old brother Mohammed was trapped inside the Church of the Nativity for the whole 40 days during the siege. Apparently when the internationals went in there was so much cheering inside the church he first thought Palestine had been liberated. <laughs> In the morning, as I prepared to leave, I thought about the extraordinary lives of these people and about the foreigners who travel thousands of miles to join them in their plight. Italian graffiti covers the walls. There's an alleyway in the camp now called Brussels Street, and most of the refugees speak some English. What's your name? My name is Jeremy. What's your name? Marwa. Marwa. Our presence improves morale and helps record the Palestinian story, a fact I was reminded of today and last night. But later when I watched kids practice their stone throwing technique and trying to convert new arrivals to their version of the Intifada, I wondered about our role here. How much can we really achieve? Will we ever succeed in bringing changes to the lives of these people? There is no reason to use violence. The people are just trying to go to their homes. There was a girl who was 17 who was shot here and asked us to come here to help us. I understand what you feel. These are not terrorists who go to their homes. This is not Tel Go back, go back, listen, go back. This is. This is this is not your This is There's no reason to use force this against okay. these people. I cannot let these people pass. You have guns, you have guns. Yes, telling them to go home is my job. As you do in America, and after terrorist attack, I don't want to say what the Americans do in Afghanistan. While others are helping at checkpoints, we've decided to join an unusual action today. I've got my mobile, my wind-up mobile phone charger that Chris recommended I get. Are you serious? <laughs> Several peace groups have joined forces from Europe and from Israel. Together we'll try and break the siege of the village of Solfeet, carrying through much-needed medical supplies. The village has been isolated for more than a year, and similar attempts by activists have met with violence from the army, ending with beatings and arrests. You can't get Palestinian beer here, can you? Um, I do. Because I like that Thai bay. I don't like Maccabee. Thai bay? I got it. Yes, you give me five minutes more to put on the orange. You are Miss Catherine? Yes, you give me five minutes more. Everyone is very nervous, but we're placing our hope in the sheer weight of numbers. Yeah. 
There are going to be seven coach loads, 400 of us. We stop for medical supplies on the way. It seems the police have caught a whiff of something going on, but everyone is acting calmly. Syringes. I speak English. Me? No, sorry. Okay, so if you want to take this, yeah. you take it from now until the end of the day. Okay. Okay? Take it with you to the, to the bus. Yeah. When, when we get down from the buses, you go backwards, not forwards. Right. Okay? If there's any, any kind of contact with the army, right. we don't want the equipment, the medicines Damaged. to be a part of that. Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, I think this is quite good having this box because um, it means I have to keep the equipment safe, which means I have to keep myself safe. So I have an excuse for hanging out in the back and not being sharp, which I'm quite pleased with. I've got syringes to sell on the common back home. This is too big, this box, isn't it? Oh. Yeah. If you see me about to be hurt, you have to throw yourself on me to protect the equipment. That's what they said, especially that guy, Chris. Are you following us? Do you think they've seen us? Isn't it just Israeli, sir? It's illegal to go in there. Zero, five, seven, seven. I'm just writing down the telephone number of the, one of the organisers here. This is the emergency number. If I get arrested, I can get a lawyer, apparently. Let's check what? No, yes, sir. Police, army, there too. And just think that even so, we're gonna, we might try to break through the, the set point, and one of our... So, here's the plot. If the army do not let us in, everyone will have to descend at once. The coaches will depart swiftly, leaving us to face the army as we make a run for the village. Everyone's putting rags on their heads, that's a bit worrying. Right, I'm just going to try and find out what's happening. Um, what were you saying about um, a penalty being three years? For, is that for Israeli citizens who...? Yeah, that's the penalty uh, written in the law, yeah? It's yeah. up to three years in jail. Yeah. It never, never happened. Right. Uh, what happens most of the time is like a few days in jail and, and a big uh, amount of fine. I mean, uh, expensive fine. Right, and that's for Israelis who enter the... Israelis going in area A. Yeah. But you're going to come with us anyway? Yeah, or you come with us. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's I think they're just doing the head count on the buses now. Uh, they didn't want to let us go and they want to know how many people there's in, in each bus. They're not going to take names. They want to count us. Ah, interview this guy, yeah. Tell us about your gun. <laughs> That's big. How many bullets does it fire, mister? <laughs> I bet that impresses the chicks, doesn't it? No, don't, don't tell him any. No, no, no. No, I won't. Okay. Shalom. Shalom. You know what shalom means? Yes. It means hello, but yeah. also peace. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> so terrible. That's why we're here. <laughs> shalom. Do you think your views are becoming increasingly prevalent among the people of your generation? Which way do you think opinion is moving? Sharon has uh, tremendous uh, support. Yeah. If, if the elections would be now, uh, <laughs> I can't even think what would be the results. <laughs> it would be, I don't know, like. 
Wait a minute. Our bus has started moving. They are letting us in. The number of people on the buses did work. This is Salfeet, the land of milk and honey, lying atop some of the most valuable fresh water resources in the West Bank, a much coveted asset for Israel. I spoke to a man who said that, um, that no car has come down there in a year and a half. Today we managed to give Selfie a new, albeit short, lease of life. It's keeping the sun off me, eh? We chose to stand up and be counted, and when the Israeli border police did the counting, there were enough of us to make a difference. They tried, as soon as the essential things, they tried to bring in all kinds of ways, they tried to send an ambulance, but they just to bring in small essential things, and they will return her back. Right. So this has been very successful today. Yeah. Yes, it's good. No, no. I know I look like a dickhead, but I'd rather that than sunstroke. This is definitely a cause of hilarity, this hat. I don't know why. <laughs> Maybe it's only children and girls wear hats like this. That's all right. If people choose freedom, then fate will have to give way. No night is eternal, no chains are impossible to break. It makes me want to cry. I'm glad I came back this time. I, I was very hesitant about it, but I'm glad I sort of went back to Bethlehem particularly. And I was glad to take part in an action that I thought was constructive. Whereas when I was over before, the only action I took part in involved us going on a bit of a march and being shot at. So are you going to come back? Yeah, I will come back, probably. There's some sort of bizarre death wish. I guess it's something that if you've got children, you'd, you'd think twice about coming. I'm prepared to take risks, but it's a very dangerous thing to try and... I mean, we are interfering with the activities of an army um, and trying to stop what it's doing, and that's very, very dangerous. So this is now your fourth visit. 
it, right. Is this sort of now the main sort of focus of your activism, do you think, in, in, in life? Yeah, definitely. There's, yeah, that's the main thing that I do. Even though it's the grimmest place to come to, I, I find it um, extremely rewarding. I take my six weeks annual leave and come to Palestine. Okay. <coughs> I'm going to Nablus tomorrow. And why? What have they got that we haven't got? <laughs> <laughs> I hope you have a good time. Never mind that I'll be worried sick about you. You go. Uh. <coughs> so what are you going to do in Nablus then, Chris? I'm either going to be staying with the families of suicide bombers um, who are likely to be targeted by the Israeli military uh, to try and protect them. Or I'm going to be riding in ambulances because ambulances are uh, often attacked by the Israeli army. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> So, you must have a really <laughs> shit travel agent, Chris. You should know that. It's according to your own law. You may think this is not your idea of a holiday, to come here and get shot at by the Israeli army. But hey, I've got a tan, and you probably won't get killed. Although I can't promise. So why did I come back? I came back because of a sense of unfinished business. But leaving this time seems even harder than before. Most of my new friends are staying and others are joining all the time. I think Layla dreams that one day the whole world will turn up in the West Bank in a miraculous stunt to dazzle the Israeli army. Certainly, Palestinians need the support of thousands to recover the basics of normal life. Will Layla's dream ever come true? I don't know. But she's got me in the ranks now. What success the movement will have, I'm not sure. But what is certain is that we're not going to give up. Son svegliata, oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, 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 una mattina mi sono svegliata ed ho trovato l'invaso. Oh partigiano, portami via, oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, 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 partigiano, portami via perché mi sembra di morire. Ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, 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 ciao